I am Matt O'Lean. Welcome to Prairie Pulse. I'm sitting in for John Harris this week. Coming up later on Prairie Pulse, we'll profile filmmaker John Hansen, who made the groundbreaking North Dakota film Northern Lights back in 1979. But first, our guest is USDA Rural Development State Director for North Dakota, Jasper Schneider. Hi, Jasper. Hi. Thanks so much Thank for having me. You bet. First of all, tell folks about yourself, your background, where you're from originally, and how you got to, to USDA. Sure, sure. Well, it's uh, I grew up, my story starts here. Uh, I grew up in Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, born and raised, and I went to public schools, went to Hawthorne Elementary, Agassiz Junior High, graduated from Fargo South, uh, went to Jamestown College, and uh, graduated uh, from there with a criminal justice and IT degree. Uh, when I was in college, I, I started a, a small tech company online that, that grew up and, and did well, uh, allowed me to pay my way through law school. I went down to the cities for that and went to Hamlin University for law school, uh, graduated from there, returned back to Fargo. Uh, started a law practice with my, my, uh, my two uncles at Schneider Law Firm and uh, ran for the North Dakota Legislature in 2006 and was successful in representing uh, District 21, which was basically central Fargo, all of downtown. Uh, and then uh, in 2009, uh, took an appointment uh, to be the state director of USDA Rural Development. And so for the past five years or so, I uh, have been doing that and uh, it's, been a, it's been quite the adventure. Uh, on the personal side, Matt, I, uh, I married my high school sweetheart, Kim, who's also from Fargo, and uh, together we have four wonderful children, a nine-year-old, a five-year-old, and then we have two two-year-olds. So you're busy. Very busy. <laughs> Between work and kids, it's... Uh, I thought I was busy with two of them, but I think you're busier. <laughs> well, I, uh, I have a lot of credit. I give a lot of credit to anybody yeah. that has young kids and, and works full-time. It's a, it's, a, it's a blessing, but it's, a, it's also a lot of work. Yeah. So what does USDA Rural Development do? Just give us an overview of what your agency department does. Sure. So we're a, we're a mission area within the United States Department of Agriculture. And rural development is actually made up of three different federal agencies. Uh, the Rural Housing Service, the Rural Business Service, and the Rural Utility Service. And together that makes up rural development. A and what that means for a state like North Dakota, uh, which is essentially a, a rural state, right? We always have been, likely always will be. Uh, our two biggest industries, agriculture, energy production, both very much rural industries. And so what we do at Rural Development is so synonymous with kind of the growth and success of, of North Dakota. And what we do in Rural Development is uh, a lot of different things, uh, but essentially provide uh, public financing uh, for infrastructure projects, whether it's utilities, homes, uh, hospitals, uh, long-term care facilities. Uh, and we do that through um, congressional action, mm -hmm. uh, largely through the Farm Bill. Uh, that provides these access to capital in North Dakota and it's really helping kind of lay the foundation for all of North Dakota's long-term success. And what did this last farm bill mean for USDA? I know there was a lot of, uh, it took a while to get through Congress, but what did it mean for your department? Yeah, it, it took far too long, yeah. um, but it's here uh, and it's good. What it does uh, for producers, it certainly gives certainty to them, uh, gives them a safety net uh, through crop insurance. But what it means to an agency like Rural Development uh, is a lot of things. It continues our, our rural broadband program. Uh, it expands the definition of our housing programs. Uh, USDA defines rural probably differently than how mm -hmm. you and I would. Right. Uh, they define uh, rural uh, in our housing programs now up to communities of 35,000 uh, in population. And where that's really significant in a state like North Dakota is with Dickinson and Williston. Yeah that are continually booming uh, and it, it protects them to stay eligible for these important housing programs. I know today you wanted to talk about some specific, specific projects in the Bakken that you're working on. Can you tell us about that? I know there's all kinds of things going on there, but how does how does USDA play into that? Yeah, it, it, as, as everybody knows, uh, North Dakota these last five years just has gone boom, uh, especially with growth in the Bakken. Uh, and with that comes the need for essential infrastructure. And so what's what's interesting about uh, our programs uh, at Rural Development and, and the Bakken is that all of that area is, is an eligible rural area. And so what we've been able to do specifically in the Bakken uh, has been able to build out the kind of the nuts and bolts infrastructure, things like the utilities, partnering with the rural electric cooperatives uh, in places like Basin Electric uh, to build a transmission line, uh, to de deploy a high-speed broadband internet connection, partnering with our rural telecoms, uh, to build out uh, our water systems, our electrical systems, our telecom systems uh, to really meet the demands of, of population uh, and industry growth. Because the reality is that that's nuts and bolts infrastructure. And if you don't have that basic foundation in place, uh, you don't get uh, private sector investment and you really can't support growth. 
And so it's been a great partnership and we've just been doing a, a tremendous amount of work in the Bakken uh, to support growth, um, both in terms of industry and population. Uh, in addition to that, I uh, have done a lot with housing uh, up there. Uh, certainly housing is an issue uh, all over the state. Uh, and also with, uh, we've also put a special emphasis on, on child care and medical facilities. Um, because with, with population growth also comes the need for, yeah. for those essential services. Are things moving too fast for you guys to keep up, for the state to keep up? Uh, what do you think? Well, I, I like to look at it not necessarily in terms of, 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 of fast or slow, but I, I would advocate that we need to grow smartly. Uh, and I think that's smart, very smartly, intelligently, uh, and strategically. Uh, and that means making sure that we're not just thinking ahead to the next construction season uh, or the next biennium, but really looking ahead 10, 20 years about how do we make sure we, we capitalize on this, on this short-term prosperity? Because this, this, really, this prosperity hasn't been here for that long, mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that it's here for the long run. And, and we need to do that by making sure we build out uh, essential infrastructure, uh, we balance uh, development with quality of life issues, uh, because North Dakota has always been a great place to live, uh, and we need to make sure that it's, it continues to be a great place to live for, for generations to come. What is the housing situation like, or does it depend? Does it vary from from community to community right now? It's it's tough. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say that the shortage of affordable, uh, quality housing uh, is is a, at emergency levels, certainly out in the Bakken. Uh, but as we as I travel the state. Uh, it's, it's, that issue is a challenge. It's a challenge here in Fargo. It's an issue up and down the valley uh, in our rural communities all over the state. And, and here's what's interesting about housing. It's really become a workforce issue. Uh, it's, it's, because, it's a workforce issue because you're not going to be able to attract or retain workers uh, if you don't solve the housing issue. Uh, and it's, that's essentially true for essential public service workers, uh, especially out in the West. You may not be able to uh, uh, attract a, a deputy sheriff or a nurse mm -hmm. or a teacher uh, unless, unless you solve that issue. And so what we're seeing is, is communities being much more proactive and strategic uh, in trying to get into the housing game to figure that out, uh, but also businesses um, not wanting to get into the housing game but realizing they have to to secure a, a workforce. Is there a hesitancy, Jasper, to, for people to build houses and apartments out there because if, if suddenly EPA says fracking is not going to continue, it's dangerous, it's ruining the environment, this thing will end, right, very quickly, or it could. You know, I, I think a lot of folks try to, try to point fingers at the EPA, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, the EPA is certainly doing their own thing. Right. Uh, I think that the biggest uh, challenge uh, for the industry uh, is an is a, is a, is a, is a, is a environmental disaster. Um, and so I think that's the, the bigger concern, and I think any time you're doing development, uh, anytime you're doing lending, public financing, uh, in, a, in a volatile industry like oil and gas production, it's, it's boomed and bust before, uh, there's inherently some risk involved. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, I think we have to bet on ourselves uh, and make sure that we you know, take control of our destiny uh, to make sure that this is here for the long run, that we're being good stewards of the land, uh, but also uh, utilizing these, these natural resources uh, to the greatest extent possible. You mentioned USDA is involved in you know child care and health care and things like that. Yeah, is that a big issue in the Bakken? It must be because I mean families are moving in. It's not just single men. There are families coming in. I know that the school yeah. population is ballooning in Williston. So yeah. tell us about those needs. Well, you know to make to make a Watford city to make a Williston uh, really family friendly communities that will survive a boom and a bust. You got to have families. You got to have people living and working there, wanting to be there. And we talked about housing as a workforce issue. No doubt about it, uh, close second is the shortage of quality, affordable childcare. Um, and the reality is the, the communities and the businesses that figure out the housing issue, that figure out the daycare issue, are gonna be able to attract uh, and retain, more importantly, uh, workers. And, and, and with that population growth, with industry growth, also comes the need for emergency services hospitals, clinics, uh, and you can't forget long-term care facilities either. You know, we have our, our seniors that have been living in those communities and those counties their whole lives. Uh, and uh, as, they, as they age, uh, to get into a quality facility that maintains their proximity to their family, their friends, their networks, uh, is so incredibly important. And so we've, we've focused uh, uh, very sharply on building out our healthcare infrastructure in this state too. Most of our healthcare facilities uh, five years ago uh, were built in the, in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, uh, and healthcare delivery has changed so much during that time. And so we've done a number of 
hospitals, clinics, long-term care facilities, emergency services, wellness centers, uh, to try to meet that demand. Um, and uh, that's been a top priority of mine. I know there was recently or coming up a federal housing training seminar in Fargo. Is that right? Is there that is. coming up soon? Tell us about that and what that is isn't going to involve. Sure. We're, we're partnering with HUD, Housing and Urban okay. Development, uh, to do a, a free housing conference here in Fargo uh, at the Ramada Plaza Suites uh, on June 3rd. And uh, the goal of that is to uh, work, with, work with practitioners, whether it's lenders, home builders, realtors, uh, anybody that's working in the housing uh, industry uh, to get, bring them together, uh, to share ideas, to get updates on federal programs. Uh, we're gonna have representatives from the, the two senators' offices there well t as well to talk about some federal legislation update. Uh, and it should be a good day mm -hmm. and uh, free of charge as well. You mentioned clinics and healthcare all across the state. Do you guys have anything to do with, I know some people sometimes in the rural areas struggle to, to find healthcare, you know, farm workers, that kind of thing, farmers. It, do you do anything with the Affordable Care Act in, in getting that out to people and trying to sign up for that or how does that work with your department? You know, we, being the Department of Agriculture, we don't, right. we don't do anything specifically with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, obviously the hospitals are our partners, mm -hmm. the hospitals, the clinics, the long-term care facilities, you know, I, I, I assume they work cl closely with uh, the Department of Human Services and Health uh, with Affordable Care Act issues and, you know, that's something we, we monitor but aren't actively engaged in. Have we seen clinics and other things spring up in the Bakken in the last few years? More things, tell us about that. Yeah, and, and so uh, I mentioned our focus on healthcare and uh, certainly we've done things out in the east, uh, Jamestown Hospital being the new one. Anybody that drives down I-94 sees that, that wonderful new regional medical facility. Uh, but I'll, I've also put a sharp focus on building out healthcare infrastructure uh, in the Bakken. Um, we uh, were uh, close to uh, finalizing the financing on a $55 million Watford City mm -hmm. Hospital. Uh, and that's a, I mean, who would have thought Watford City, you know, five, even yeah. five years ago would be able to support that level of facility. Uh, we did a clinic with, with Trinity two years ago in, in Williston. We did a new hospital in, in Tioga and to Crosby. Um, where uh, we did a new Bowman in the Southwest, I mean a new hospital in Bowman mm -hmm. uh, in the Southwest uh, just pa this past year. And so lots of things are happening. Uh, and with the growth uh, also comes the need for those those medical services. Yeah, no, th these sound great. You talk about a new hospital in Watford City, but again, yeah. getting workers there, how is how difficult is that going to be to get nurses and doctors to Watford City? It's, that's that's yeah. the challenge. I mean, uh, work, North Dakota's biggest challenge right now is, is lack of a workforce, uh, especially for those essential care workers, uh, law enforcement, uh, teachers, hospital workers. Uh, a new facility helps. And so, you know, the, what we're trying to do is, is break the bottleneck of, of a shortage of access to capital. You know, we have a, a legislature, and I used to be a, a member mm -hmm. of the, the North Dakota legislature that meets only once every two years. Uh, we have a very short construction season uh, because of the long North Dakota winters. Uh, and our funding cycle, especially these last couple of years, have been, been very stop and go. Obviously, we started this year with the government shutdown. And, and so it's very erratic in, 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 in the funding sources. And so. We're, we're trying to get ahead of this, uh, and as you build out your infrastructure, as you build out your housing, as you build out your medical facilities, uh, certainly that helps alleviate the workforce issue a little bit in trying to attract uh, and retain people, but it, it's a challenge, mm -hmm. probably our biggest. How has the population increase in the state affected your office? Have you added employees? How does that work, or, or how has that gone? Well, it's uh, just to give you an idea how we're structured, and we have 44 employees in the state. Uh, we have state offices in Bismarck, and we've got field offices in, in Devil's Lake, uh, Valley City, Dickinson, and Minot. Uh, we've actually reduced employees. Uh, from when I started five years ago, uh, we've reduced about 25%. Uh, and that's largely been to do some pretty tough budgets from the Congress the last couple of years. We went through a sequestration uh, that, that cut us pretty severely. And so the, the irony is that uh, as our workload continues to increase, mm -hmm. the demand for our programs continues to increase, uh, our, our, our general support dollars and our people continue to go down. But I'll tell you what, I work with some great men and women that are, are hardworking, good North Dakotans, dedicated to the mission of our agency, and, and we persevere. We've reorganized a couple times to try to meet up with the demand, and uh, we've persevered. What is the state of rural North Dakota or farm life in North Dakota right now, do you think? Or does it depend on what part of the state you're in? We're, uh, things are good. I mean, we're incredibly fortunate right now to be uh, in North Dakota. It's been fascinating uh, to be working in rural development and to be from North Dakota. I, I, I meet with my counterparts all over the country. They're always asking me, what's, what, what's going on in North Dakota? What, do, what are you doing well? 
And I, I think as we look to our, our, our long term, uh, you know, you, North Dakota has always been uh, an agrarian based state. Agriculture will probably always continue to be our, our number one industry. Uh, but we're at such a historic moment right now in our state's history uh, that we, we have an enormous opportunity to really define our future uh, and not let our future define us. Uh, but it takes leader to, leadership, it takes courage, uh, it takes uh, um, a lot of uh, political will uh, to kind of persevere and to make uh, good, good decisions. I think the worst thing that could happen to us is we look back on this time mm -hmm. of prosperity 20 years from now and, and wish we had made wiser choices and, and smarter investments. Um, because we could get this wrong. Um, yeah. You know, things do change quickly. Uh, and as, as the national economy continues to heal, um, you know, hopefully North Dakota continue to, can, can continue uh, to pave the way for economic success. Um, but we, uh, we still have some, a lot of work to do. And it's a balancing act, right? I mean, I'm, I'm almost reminded when you just gave that answer of Art Link's statement about when the landscape is quiet again, right? right? Yeah. I mean, how does that play into this? Well, it's, I mean, it's such, that's... such impressive words that he spoke all those years ago. Yeah, and, and what, what great guiding words for, for this time, right? Uh, uh, things will slow down at some point. Um, you know, we're talking about a, a non-renewable resource. Uh, we don't know if that's going to be five years from now, 50 years from now, 500 years from now. Uh, but there is going to come a time when uh, that one-time resource is going to be gone. Uh, and what does North Dakota look like? What are our industries? Where are our population centers? Uh, what's our infrastructure look like? Um, and how are we setting things up for our future generations? And I think that's the most important thing we have to keep in mind is uh, these investments we make today are not for us. I mean, it's, it, these are the investments that we're making for future generations. Uh, these decisions we're making uh, with the Bank of North Dakota as it relates to student loans, these infrastructure investments, uh, whether it's high-speed broadband internet that's really tapping into young people's entrepreneurial spirits, um, you know, roads, bridges, uh, water systems, uh, these are all long-term investments that uh, hopefully will pave the way for, for long-term success. What are your goals specifically in your position for the next couple of years or how lo however long you stay in the, in the position? Well, I, 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 uh, I hope to be here a little while yet, but uh, you know, I, I, I love North Dakota. Um, it's been uh, an absolute honor to be the state director uh, at USDA. Uh, having been born and raised in Fargo and, and getting that perspective, having lived now in Bismarck for the last five years and traveling all over the state, uh, North Dakota is a wonderful place. Uh, we have such enormous potential. We've got wonderful people, uh, and with with our with our with our budget surpluses, with our own lending institution, with a hot economy, uh, we are really well positioned to define our future. And so, my goals at USDA uh, are to continue making making good investments uh, and to really pay, set the lay the, make the build the foundation uh, for long term success. And that means uh, figuring out the housing issue continuing to build out our, our, our infrastructure. Uh, I, I care a lot about medical facilities, uh, but also high-speed broadband internet. Mm -hmm. I think that's 21st century infrastructure. Uh, that's something that's really breaking down the digital divide that rural and urban have always had. If people want to get a hold of your office, learn more about USDA rural development, where can they go? I assume you have a website. Yeah, they can always just start finding us at USDA.gov, uh, or uh, they can call us at 701-530-2037. 5302037. Okay. Thanks, Jasper. Hey. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. Jasper Schneider, State Director for USDA Rural Development for North Dakota. Stay tuned for more. In 1978, John Hansen and his filmmaking partner, Rob Nielsen, set out to make a low budget movie about the beginnings of North Dakota's nonpartisan league. In 1915 and 1916, the NPL transformed North Dakota politics by giving farmers a voice they had been denied up to that point. Hansen and Nielsen's film, Northern Lights, was shot near Crosby, North Dakota, and went on to win the prestigious Camera Door at the 1979 Cannes Film Festival. Recently, we talked with Hansen at his Bayville, Wisconsin home about the makings of this groundbreaking film. We shot this film in no time at all for no money. Oh, you're going to be sold on it too. The next few months are going to be critical. Oh, come on. Don't get started on the league again. My grandfather told me stories about the nonpartisan league when I was a kid because I spent summers on the farm. I didn't know what it was. We didn't study it in high school, as far as I remember. So I, didn't, I really didn't know a thing about it. And so that was the, the first nugget 
was way back when, of course, I didn't even have any idea of being, becoming a filmmaker. And then as time went on and I joined Cine Manifest, Rob and I were partners, I decided I want to make a movie in North Dakota. What do you make a movie about? Hey, a nonpartisan league. So, when I became 21, I followed in my father's footsteps and went up to northwestern North Dakota. Uh, but Henry Martinson was the key. You talk about an extraordinary man. We couldn't have done the film without him. And of course, he's in the film. You know, he plays the storyteller at the beginning and, and the end. You know, we would write a script for him, and he'd say, well, what if we say it this way? You know, he's, he was a great writer, poet, you know, union man. What will you say? Yes. Because there's only three actors in the film. The rest are all North Dakota farmers and people we met along the way. And that was purposeful. I mean, because we wanted to, to tell the story of the League from the inside, from the point of view of the small farmer, like my grandfather. We didn't want to tell it from the top down, and we didn't want to stand back at a distance. We wanted, what we re really wanted to do was to get inside what it was like to be a farmer at that time and have this League come around, somebody coming to your door, hey, we want you to join up. Wait a minute here. <laughs> well, you know, we were lucky because we met people, the farmers and the small town people, who, who were so themselves, and we wrote parts for them, you know, that fit them. And they were fearless, and they were terrific. You know, the, the mother and father, the Nesses from up by Crosby, up by Ambrose, um, they'd never acted before. So yes, it's a feature film, but it has the, the, the realism of a documentary. It has the, and that was purposeful. Some people use the word docudrama, but it was all scripted. All these people had to learn lines. All right, let me, uh, let me ask you fellas a question then. If you buy a pound of coffee, who sets the price for that coffee? God only knows, Ray. And it's person to person. You know, it isn't just speeches. You come out to the farm, you talk to the people, his neighbor is sitting beside you. That's a, a, a way of organizing that the socialists actually came up with. You know, the League finally came to their rescue. And because they're, they're genius at organizing, they were able to take over the state. Where are you going? Both Rob and I, Scandinavians, uh, love Bergman. And I'd seen all of Bergman's film by then, films by then. In fact, when I was in college, I was the, the projectionist. This is in the 60s, when the Bergman films were just coming into this country. But you know, when you're out in that prairie with that huge sky, you feel about this high, right? And so the whole notion was to have this, the landscape against the people and vice versa. So that you were always the sense that that you were in, a, in, a, in this huge, vast space. And in a way, it was a metaphor for being, for the powerlessness they had. You know, we didn't want to have a Hollywood look to it. It, was, it wasn't going to be like Citizen Kane, you know. We wanted a gritty look, and, you know, and, and that's why farmers are in their own garb and they're not shaven and they're, we're out there in the, in the dirt with them. Well, when we finished Northern Lights, there were no independent distributors. We had to distribute it ourselves. So we went around uh, town to town. Who owns a movie theater? You know, hello, we got a movie that's going to come out. Would you book it? And we, we started, of course, in Crosby. Dakota Theater in Crosby was the premiere in July of 1978. And then we went to all the little towns around there, and, and it spread across North Dakota. Well, of course, the premiere night at Crosby was unbelievable because all the people in the film <laughs> were in the audience. And then word starts to spread, hey, what's this, you know? So we got a booking in Minneapolis. That was our first big city booking. And, um, and then we applied to the Cannes Film Festival just because, why not, you know? Never expecting to get in, but got to do it. And got accepted and went there 
I mean, talk about rookies. Went there and ran around trying to get people to see the movie, and then we win a prize. And once we won the prize, that was what propelled it to be at bookings all over the country and back in the United States. But then the late mail train came in. The rural vote had turned things around. And so it touched a nerve. Just like the Nonpartisan League, Nonpartisan League had touched a nerve back in the old days, Northern Lights in some way touched the same nerve with these small town people. And then of course went on to uh, be, be seen all over the world after that. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funding for Minnesota Legacy Programs are provided by a grant from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. And by the members of Prairie Public.